Welcome to another episode of The Buzz Around Bees. Today we're doing our yearly wrap-up, uh, and I'm very pleased to have with us today Ann Rain, who is the president of the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association, and Glenn Cornell, who is actually the director of Bee School? Correct. Mm -hmm. So before we do this roundtable discussion of the state of the bees and stuff, <clears throat> let's talk for a few minutes about the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association. I know that, that I've been going to bee school for for several years now. And when I tell friends that oh, I got to go because I'm going to bee school, they're like, what? I'm going to tell you because I am absolutely fascinated with bees. And I have been since I first started studying them before I started raising them. Um, so the Plymouth County Beekeepers Association has the school which you run. Um, and I've noticed that when I first started, there weren't anywhere near as many students in the school as there are now. But Ann, why don't you just tell us um, about the whole Beekeepers Association, what you do, and maybe Glenn can talk about the school. Our main um, focus is education um, to the public through our, our, uh, the Marshfield Fair, it's our biggest outreach of the year. But so, it's a social club. Um, the way I look at it is we're a bunch of adults that play with singing, stinging insects, so we're automatically gonna be drawn <laughs> together. It's fun. Uh, we have events all year long. We organize the package bee order, which is ongoing right now, and then we do the glassware, and then we have the Marshall Fair. But in between, we'll have we'll have potluck suppers and Christmas parties, and you know, just just the regular stuff that a social group does. And you have a meeting every month. Yes, correct? we have monthly meetings. Usually the third, no, the fourth Wednesday of the month. I always screw that up. Fourth Wednesday of the month, except we have a couple of months where we have functions where we, you know, like the potluck supper or Christmas party. You know, I, <clears throat> and I've been to a few of the meetings other than going to school for several years. Um, and the support that, that the club offers to people when you have um, a meeting about overwintering bees or... That, that's in September. We try to make sure that we have a, something to prep people for overwintering. And we always try to have, ask the beekeeper. So if you have a question at the beginning of the meeting, ask away. And then I went to one one time when it was um, about, um, well, there was a, 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 a meeting regarding the mites and how to treat the hives, but there was another one about extracting honey. So, I mean, the association really offers a lot of support for beekeepers, especially it was helpful for me when I was a, a newbie, as they call them. Mm -hmm. um, and now the school. Glenn, tell us about... Um, just how much the registration has exploded uh, in the last several years. Yes, yeah, so over the last few years, uh, I think it was television promos and one sixty Minutes did something about the disappearing bees and people started perking up. Um, they started looking into it and of course now they look local. Besides YouTube, they start looking lo local and <coughs> We really offer a great value. It's a beginner's course. That's, I mean, it's only the start. We couldn't possibly teach everything that they need to know. So the course that we offer uh, is $50. You get a book, uh, the handouts. You get to meet all the people. And uh, we offer packages to them if we have them and, and yeah. really get them off the ground to get started. But it's only a beginning. And we could never, ever possibly talk about everything there is to do with bees. And one of the things I try and emphasize on them, in my personal opinion, it takes about five years for a dedicated person to become a good beekeeper. Yeah. So that's where the club follows up. And what, what Ian was just talking about with where we do the September, uh, closing your hive, opening your hive, what you have to look for through the year. We have three or four or five or six meetings, <coughs> and then yeah. every single meeting that we have, we have asked the beekeeper for anybody that has problems so that, that they don't know how to address. Uh, you know, and I've said this many times, that I, I'm fascinated by beekeeping. 
And I know that it was very helpful to me when I first started being a beekeeper to go to school, to go to some of the meetings. I remember leaving one night the clubhouse in Hanson, and I forget what the talk was about, but I got in the car and I called my wife on the way home and I said, do you know what we know about bees? And she said, what? And I went, nothing. I, I said, nothing. Because compared to, and I've said this many times, mm -hmm. with, you two have forgotten more about bees than I'll ever know. But I mean, it's like, it's, there's so much knowledge with some of these beekeepers. Um, it's just really helpful for someone that's a newbie to, to be involved with the association and the club and all that. Let's move on to talk about bees. I mean, we generally talk about a couple of bees, the ones that we're um, madly in love with mm -hmm. are the honeybees. Mm -hmm. And then there's the bumblebee, which I used to be petrified of when I was a kid, and now they're like the cutest little thing in the world. And then, of course, there's, <clears throat> there's a yellow jacket that give all bees a bad name. Yeah. And they're just evil. They're just evil bees, and we don't even like they're to talk bees. about them. They're not bees. I'm sorry, they're, they're not, not bees. bees. I know, they're I hornets. Can't they're hornets. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> but people think that they're bees, mm -hmm. so they are not bees. No, they are not. Um, let's talk about the state of the bee. I mean, there's always a lot of talk about that everybody's hives are dying, bees are becoming extinct. Um, Let's talk about that for a little bit. I mean, there's no one here that's going to give us an exact answer of why bees are dying or why bees abscond. Um, but let's just have a little general conversation about your theories about what's going on with bees and maybe talk about the difference between the bees up north in our region and what we were talking about earlier, the bees down south or other parts of the country. Well, like we were saying, all beekeeping is local. and. Well, I launch into my, whenever we talk about the, the end of the bees, it's because I really blame us. I blame agricultural chemicals. I, I blame the big egg system that puts out too much poisons and the, the bees just can't withstand it. But it's not just big egg. It's also Joe Sixpack trying to keep his lawn perfect. It's um, nowadays, too, with Lyme disease, people are killing ticks. Can't say that I blame them. It almost killed me in 2009. I get it. I, I understand it. We also can't have people dying of, uh, what was it, West Nile, the little girl down, <coughs> yep, you know, I, the little girl down in, yep. was it Middleborough that Correct. died? Yeah. Yep. I mean, we can't have that. You can't say you can't, you can't control the mosquitoes, et cetera, but it's got to be done responsibly. And I think that that's one of the biggest issues. The, the mosquito people for the county, I think, do a bang up job. But when you call Joe Pest Control to come to your house, they're going to send somebody at high noon when the bees are all out and around, and they're going to spray, and the bees are going to pick it up and bring it home, and it's not good for the hive. Does it kill them outright? No, not necessarily, but it, it will eventually. You know, it can, ev I should say, it can eventually kill them. We've had, how many people have we had? In? I, know, I know we've got one guy who lost two hives to cedar oil, and there's nothing they can do about it. Cedar, um, cedar essential oil. So it's... It's, a, it's an essential oil, blah, blah, blah. It kills everything. But what do they use it for? Ticks. Oh. They spray the perimeter. Oh, I see. Well, they sprayed the perimeter at high noon and killed, killed two hives. And there's no recourse. There's nothing you can do about it because there's nothing that says that you can't do that other than common sense. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, if they go out, like a, I know good farmers that will go out in the early, early, you know, 4, 4.30 early in the morning or late at night and do their spraying, the bees are not out. And by the time everything dries and dissipates, then they might come out. Bees are like teenagers. They, they don't leave the hive early. They're, they're, they're in there. They're working. Yeah, exactly. So really, it's, responsi it's our responsibility to take care of them, and w all of them, all the pollinators, not just bees. And we're not very good at it. Go. <laughs> so, well, one of the things that <laughs> Thank I... Thank you. Since I've been teaching the school... And I show the very first night, I think people are amazed, there's uh, a talk that Marla Spivak gave. Mm -hmm. And she's one of the leading entomologists, and I, I know a lot of entomologists can kind of disagree, but eventually they come together at some, at some point. At the top of the pyramid, they're all there. But she took a pie and cut it up into four or five pieces and she labeled each piece. So you, you have exactly what Ian was talking about, pesticides. You have the lack of uh, vegetation, the bees are starving to death. Um, you have the mite. 
and you just put add all this up together and it's a combination that I don't think the beekeeper can totally erase. We can't, we can't stop at all. You have to stop what you think you can stop and then we really rely on the public to help us with the rest. So if any, if people, there's a lot of people that go to our bee school that don't ever get bees, but if they come in, they'll just learn how you want to treat the environment <coughs> to be bee friendly. You know, I go home with a smile on my face. You don't have to have bees. I don't care whether you have bees. They may, they may scare you. You just may decide I don't want to spend that kind of money. But if they just go home with the idea that, hey, you know what, after hearing him talk, I'm going to go plant some plants, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. You know what I noticed this year, <coughs> excuse me, and I thought it was pretty interesting, is there were a lot of younger kids uh, in the school, mm -hmm. like 8, 9, 10, 12 years old, which I thought yeah. was pretty interesting, yeah. um, that the parents are bringing their kids in. And, and it really is some great knowledge that you pick up at the, at the school. Um, can we talk about overwintering and how successful or unsuccessful um, I am totally unsuccessful at, at overwintering. This year, I, I made a couple of mistakes, uh, and I've lost some of my hives already. Um, I didn't treat when I should have. Uh, we went away, and I didn't treat, and um, there's still plenty of honey in the hives, but I've had <clears throat> a couple of hives just abscond. There's nothing there. There's no bees. There's still honey. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about that for a little bit? My thought on overwintering is I, I know, and I see this in the bee school all the time, that right away people start pointing to oh, it was the cold that killed the bees. And indirectly, yes. Uh, but directly, the bees are just not prepared to go into the winter. That's part of it. Whether it be the mites, the food situation, they're just not healthy. Pesticides. Uh, I experiment sometimes. I, I have one hive this year that I didn't treat, and it's alive right now. But as a general rule, if you don't treat them, they're not going to make it. If they're not fed properly, yeah. they're not going to make it. And it's so hard for a beekeeper to look in their hive and say, well, what out of these four or five things happened to the bees that made them die? It, it, they did die because of the cold, but it died because they weren't prepared for the cold. So is the cold one of the reasons that they don't overwinter? So like in Florida, do they have an issues overwintering there? if they're treated and they're fed? Oh, there are beekeepers that will take their hives down south for the winter. People who are commercial beekeepers, they'll, they'll move down there. They might, they might be preparing for the almonds, but mainly they're, those are the guys that go down and do the orange groves, and then they come up to the peaches, then they, they, you know, they keep coming up, and then they end up here. Um, I, th I think that part of our absconding problem, we were talking about this earlier, is I think I've, I've heard, I have no proof of this, but it's, it makes sense, that there's something going on with an Africanized gene. What the Africanized bee does when it doesn't like where it lives, they pick everything up and they take off. They, they swarm constantly. Um, they can't do that <coughs> up here. If you try to swarm up here in, in October, you're gonna die because there's no, there's no time for you to build another hive. But I think that that's in the bees somehow because of the migratory beekeepers and the, and the way of packaged bees down south. And that brings up the whole issue of we should be raising our own bees up here. Well, we know how hard it is to get queen things going and you know breeding bees up here. You, there's no way Plymouth County beekeepers could supply all the bees that people want out of a program up here. It just couldn't happen. So my, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot going on about overwintering that's regional for us, but it's it, people having problems with it across the country. So when we talk about the packages, and <clears throat> people might not know what we're talking about, so we buy a package of bees, and mm -hmm. a package of bees is a little wooden box with some screen on it mm -hmm. that has three pounds of bees, mm -hmm. and it's roughly 10,000 bees in the package. Um, and they're raised and down. Queen. And, and, and the queen in her own little, in her own little traveling yeah. um, box <clears throat> inside. And those are raised down south, those shipped up here. not necessarily raised down south, that's my point. Those bees have come out of migratory hives. They've made the circuit. They've come back down south. 
and now they, they're taken out of their hives and they're shaken into these packages and a foreign queen is inserted into the package. So it's not the nicest thing in the world and people do have issues with it and I understand that, but it's the only way that people up here are gonna get bees reliably. It's the only way. And I will say that the people we deal, deal with down south, they do a wonderful job. They've been doing this for decades. It's not like they're new at it. I don't think it's, we can fault them, and I know they have a good queen breeding program down there. Is there something to be said for winter genetics up here? Maybe, but before the varroa mite, there was none of these issues. There were packaged bees coming out of the south, and they lived, you put them in the backyard over the winter, you went out there in the springtime, started putting supers on it because the bees lived. So when you bring it, boil it right down to the mite, it's the, it's the varroa mite. That's the root of our problem. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? The varroa <coughs> mite? Yeah. Which brings me to the, we did an episode last year at your house, which was called the sugar shake. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I just thought was pretty amazing. And I, it, it was filmed, and you're going to show that, I think, at, at school, right? Yeah. Yes. yes, in a couple more weeks, I'll, I'll be showing that uh, film that we did at my house about how to count the mites. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things is that people, most people that get into beekeeping, they want to think natural. I want to be all natural. And there's nothing more unnatural than taking a pesticide and putting it in your beehive. Mm -hmm. But it's controlled. Okay, we have to think this is for the betterment of the bees. As much as I don't like to do it, it's a necessary evil. And, and if we use it right, it, it will work properly. Uh, so... What you want to do is, if you have the time, you want to count the mites. And all the scientists or entomologists have sat down and developed a, a certain number that the, mites, that the bees can tolerate. Once they reach that point, it's treatment. Or we can just about guarantee doom with a hive. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's going to be doomed. Unfortunately, a lot of people can't do that. So I guess the next best thing to do would be just treat all your hives. Prophylactic treatment. And if you do it right, it's not that harmful to the bees. And the mites haven't been around here for all that many what, years. Was it 84? It was in like the that. 80s. Something like 1984. That, and it was introduced by a beekeeper down south or something? From Florida. From Florida. Yeah, he and now some bees in illegally. And yeah. Yeah. So the them. mite is what a lot of people think are killing off the bees as well, which are killing the bees. And they are killing the bees. I would say, <coughs> you know, Excuse if you don't me. treat for mites, uh, <laughs> you could just about guarantee that that's what killed the bees. And, but then there's the people that say if we don't let the bees die and develop, you know, they'll, they'll evolve and they'll develop and blah, blah, blah. But that's a nice thought. Hasn't worked yet, has it? So, I mean, I think everybody really has a theory, yeah. but nobody has an actual answer because there's so many things out there that could be killing the bees. That's why I keep going back to Mala Spivak and she mm -hmm. comes out with this no one, no one thing. piece no of one that thing. pie right. that's killing the bees. If, if it's it a was, multitude. we'd have it figured out. It's a multitude of things that are, that are killing the bees. But I'll tell you, I go up <coughs> to more beekeepers and they'll say, oh, my hives died. And I'll say, well, did you check for mites? And the very first thing is no. You get the blank stare. Did you treat? No. Yeah. Right. I rest my case. Yeah. Right. What is a nuke? Many people come and say to me, which, by the way, we're going to get to that in a minute when we talk about next year, but explain what a nuke is <clears throat> and what it does. And it's spelled N-U-C. Yeah, well, it's an <coughs> abbreviation for nucleus. So the difference between a package and a nuke is that you have a package of 10,000 bees, and they have to introduce the queen slowly. So that's all you get is bees with a can of syrup, and a queen that's in a cage because they would kill her immediately. They've been taken from their queen and they, they don't understand the problem yet. She's got a different smell and yeah. during the duration they will get used to her. Well, a nucleus is basically f most of the time four or five frames that, like what you would have in your hive and the queen has been introduced long before and she's up and laying. She's already producing in there. And before they can outspan that, out expand that box, they sell it to you. So you've got a rip roaring start here. But for a novice beekeeper, it also could come with diseases and problems. And you introduce this to a new bee, and, and there's a problem. They say, well, oh, wait a minute, I got a queen that was laying and everything was going fine. Well, you had a disease in there that you didn't recognize. Yeah. 
and, and you, you're going to go downhill even faster than a package will. I think it's better for a beekeeper to start out with a package so that they can see the whole process. Absolutely. The bee, f right from the bare, bare wax in there and watch them how fast they can build it. They're amazing little things. They, they, they immediately hit the ground running and start building wax. They're you know, unbelievable. <coughs> we had um, the first episode of last season was at the barn where we mm -hmm. pick up the bees. And <clears throat> I started by saying, let's go see what nine million bees look like. And we go in and, and you can... Did you, you see the floor, the wax on the floor? Yeah. yeah. And they've only been there no, hours. I know it. And you can hear the buzzing from nine million bees and the temperature in the back actually went up a little oh, bit. Yeah. And, and we filmed it and uh, nine million bees, it's like, my God, but they're fascinating. Yeah, and, they are. And, they're amazing. You know, you take those bees from there and you go home and you put them in your, in your hive and a few days later, the queen's out, and within, within a month, they've mm -hmm. doubled in, in numbers. And, you know, you have, you, we feed them, and we put sugar water in and, and things like that to help them along. And then it's just the whole process um, is amazing. You know, they, they are pretty smart. Yeah, they are. So there was a study the other day. Now, last year, I had heard that bees could count to four. And I didn't repeat it many times because people think that you're nuts when you say those things. But the other day, I heard or I read something that said bees can actually do arithmetic. And I don't want to say that because people are going to think that we're nuts, but I read it. So. Well, did you see the thing the other day on the, on the list about the, um, the sugar water on the boat? Did you see that? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> the sugar water on the boat. And the bees did not get excited about that sugar water because they knew that that boat was not a flower. They knew they could go out there, they could get sugar water, but they, they didn't set it up as a destination because they knew it's not a flower. I think I, I might have referred to, to this um, last year. I've referred to it in the past. There was a two-part episode of some guys from England that, that did, I think it was called Hive Alive. And they put, they put um, radar, gra oh, yeah. military-grade yeah. radar on the back of bees. Yep. And they put heat lamps in there, and they put temperature. Um, yep. th and they had a drone that would follow the bees when they left the hive and then come back and... And it's just amazing that, that, that the, the bees will go out, they'll find the honey flow, they'll come back and they'll do a waggle. Yep. And that waggle inside the hive tells the other bees where to go. I mean, bees aren't stupid. They don't live long, um, but they it's have all, a job from when they're born. They have a job. They're, they're all pro, they're programmed. I wouldn't say that they're smart, smart, but they're very well programmed to keep the hive. Because the hive is really the body, the being because everything has to work for the good of the hive. They're all working for each other together. It's not like, not like humans. <laughs> I was just going to say, no. it's too bad we couldn't do the same yeah. thing because literally like they humans. just, they work to keep the hive alive. Right. And to keep, I mean, they're born and, you know, some of them take the dead bodies out and, and others clean and others just, what is it? It's only the last several days of their life that they the go out and forage, so, right? the last week? Field bees. Half life, about half, yeah. about yeah. halfway through. In so the middle of the season, they go for a long time out there. Yeah. So and they, one bee produces one-twelfth of a teaspoon of honey something like that. in its life. Yeah. Something really crazy. It's so amazing. It, the life of a bee is just, I mean, the whole thing has me fascinated. I've been doing it for several years now, and, and I still don't know anything about bees. So if you want a, a, a good read is Bee Democracy. Mm. Um, and if, it is by Tom Seeley, and if you want to read that, bees are classified as a super, no, super organism. Yep. They have to live together. Everybody does their piece of the work, and it's for the betterment of the hive. They're not like humans where we're free thinkers. So ev everybody's pre-programmed <coughs> for so many chores, and when a chore is lacking bees, then other bees pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And it's all f to get them to that one survivability state and it's all or nothing yep. and you know, people you know they see me and they ask questions about bees and I try to answer them and if I don't know I tell them you know more than <coughs> they do maybe a little <laughs> but <laughs> nobody believes that when you tell them that you have seven hives in the backyard you could have 350,000 bees in your backyard mm -hmm. and people just don't believe that I think yeah. or they think you're kind of crazy yeah. um, but I used to be one of those that you know, was scared to death, and now it's like, you know, we pick them up and we carry them around and you take them out of the pool because they don't realize they should be going into the right. pond instead of the pool, and they won't bother you. Nope. And they're just so good and, and fascinating. So we've done a lot of shows, <coughs> excuse me, in the last two years 
Um, this is the final show of this year, and I thank you guys very much for being here. But we've been invited back to do a third year, um, which we're going to do. And it got me thinking as I was sitting in the class some weeks ago um, that we've done a lot of shows about a lot of things, but we've never really done the anatomy of a hive, meaning the equipment that we use. So I think that what we're going to do is the next show, or the, maybe the first or second show of, of next season, we'll take a hive, and we'll have the stand, and we'll have you know, all the different pieces and functions of it, and we can do a show about that, which I think would be very educational and helpful for people that are interested in getting into beehives, uh, getting into beekeeping. Um, so I'm going to invite you guys to, uh, to do that with me, and we'll have to figure out a way to do it because it's just too much equipment to bring into the studio. And uh, we can just set up a hive and show the, the bottom board. and so it, was, you know. it wouldn't be hard to bring in a quote. So we we'll got tons to, of it. We'll have to, uh, we got tons <laughs> of it. We got tons of it. We'll have to figure that out. Yeah. And um, we'll have to figure that out where we're going to do it and when we're going to do it. But I think that would be really, really important and certainly educational um, to put that out there. And, and uh, I guess we are now seen as an instrument, uh, instructional and educational show. So I want to keep along those lines that, that I want to do that with the hive. So That's again, a good idea. really good idea. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ann, for okay. being here. Thank you for Welcome. being the president yep. of the association oh. because <laughs> I know it's like doing uh, an, a, an ungodly task that, that you just don't get any thanks for. Well, so. I love I'm the very organization. Thankful. I love the organization. Yeah, yeah, organization. Not very and thankful, Glenn, thank you very yep. much thank for doing you. what you do. And thank you for right the enough. school. And thank you for joining us for another episode of The Buzz Around Bees. And we'll be back soon with, uh, with more episodes, and hopefully it will be some education for you. Thank you.